on World News Tonight. Shelling escalates. Battle of Severodonetsk Donetsk emerges as focal point in Russia's war against Ukraine. Oil embargo. EU agrees compromise deal on banning imports. Chaotic Agatha. The strongest hurricane on record makes landfall in Mexico with tourist destinations now in the impact zone. And celebrating culture. A Belgian town trotted out a larger-than-life folk ritual with a giant wooden horse. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Our top story today is still on the escalating war in Ukraine. As the battle in Ukraine's east heats up, Russian troops are trying to encycle the city of Severodonetsk, one of the largest and biggest cities in the eastern part of the country that is under Kyiv's control. The battle for Severodonetsk, one of the last big cities under Ukrainian control in the eastern part of the country, is emerging as a focal point in Russia's war against Ukraine. The governor of the Luhansk region said that Russian troops continue to bombard the area constantly as Moscow attempts to encircle the city of about 100,000 people in a bid to gain control of the Donbas region. This comes as Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky also warned earlier that fighting in the east is becoming increasingly bloody. In the aftermath of Russian strikes on Severodonetsk, all the town's critical infrastructure was destroyed. 90% of buildings are damaged. More than two-thirds of residential dwellings are completely destroyed. There is no telecommunications. The shelling is non-stop. In related news, U.S. President Joe Biden told reporters Monday that his country will not send rocket systems to Ukraine that are capable of reaching Russia. The comments follow reports that the U.S. is mulling over sending advanced long-range rocket systems to Ukraine. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin has attributed ongoing global food shortages to, quote, short-sighted Western policies. In a phone call with his Turkish counterpart Monday, Putin also explained that Russia is ready to export significant volumes of fertilizers and food in case Western sanctions against Moscow are lifted. While Russia and Ukraine together account for nearly 30 percent of global wheat exports, dozens of container ships remain blocked in Ukrainian ports by the Russian Navy, hindering exports of wheat, sunflower oil, as well as other foodstuffs. European Union leaders reached an agreement in principle to cut 90 percent of oil imports from Russia by the end of this year. European Commission Chief Ursula von der Leyen announced earlier today a deal, deal that would allow other elements of six sanctions package against Russia over its invasion of Ukraine to move forward. The European Union pledged to enforce an oil embargo against Russia late on Monday, an agreement in principle that solved a deadlock with Hungary and the toughest effort yet to sanction Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. Thanks to this, um, Council should now be able to finalize a ban on almost 90 percent of all Russian oil imports by the end of the year. European Commission Chief Ursula von der Leyen told the news conference after day one of a two-day summit the leaders of the 27 EU nations agreed to come back and discuss the remainder 10 percent as soon as possible. For now, the deal exempts 10 percent of oil from the ban so that Hungary, a landlocked country, as well as Slovenia and the Czech Republic, have access to a southern Russian pipeline. Hungary was the main holdout for a deal. All three countries said the fuel from that pipeline was difficult to replace. European Council President Charles Michel tweeted the move against Russia cuts, quote, a huge source of financing for its war machine, maximum pressure on Russia to end the war. It now clears the way for other parts of the EU's sixth and toughest sanctions package against Moscow to take effect. This includes cutting Russia's biggest bank, Sberbank, from the swift messaging system and barring EU companies from providing a range of services to Russian firms. It also blocks three Russian state media outlets from broadcasting in the EU. As the prices of commodities have gone up due to the Ukraine war, aid agencies said that the problem for Africa's worst state countries have been compounded as donor countries divert state aid to help Ukraine's refugees. When Hassan Nur arrived at this IDP camp in Somalia, he was half what a child his age should weigh. Three months later, and the one-year-old is looking healthier, thanks in part to Plumpy Nut. 
The peanut-based paste has been a crucial weapon in the fight against child malnutrition since it was developed by French scientists in the 1990s. But aid agencies say it is becoming too expensive, to an extent because of the conflict in Ukraine. Rania Degash, regional director for UNICEF, said the fundamental issue for Somalia at the moment is climate-induced drought. But where the effects of the Ukraine crisis come in is that the food prices and fuel prices and others um, are hiked up to a point where we need more resources to secure what we would have secured before. We need a lot more. UNICEF says it spends 137 million US dollars a year on therapeutic food. The overall market is estimated to be worth up to $400 million. But over the past year, the cost of Plumpy Nut has risen 23%, its main producer Nutriset has said. That includes a 9% hike imposed since the start of the Ukraine conflict, which has triggered an international food crisis and sent prices soaring. In a letter to customers in March, Nutriset warned of impending price increases. It said the costs of ingredients such as palm oil, milk powder and whey, as well as packaging, had risen sharply. Shipping expenses have also rocketed. In all, Nutriset said costs are up 39%. Aid agencies say the problem for Africa's worst hit countries has been compounded, as donor countries divert state aid to help Ukraine's refugees. Rupia Yakub is deputy director for the World Food Programme in East Africa. Uh, commodity prices have almost doubled in Somalia and in some parts 93 percent high. Uh, the humanitarian appeal for Somalia is only 15 percent funded. So what we need now is right now is money. We need the cash to avert uh, the risk of famine. UNICEF predicts the price of therapeutic food will rise 16% in the next six months because of Ukraine as well as pandemic disruptions. Without further funding, the agency warns 600,000 more children may miss out on treatment. Hurricane Agatha plowed into beach resorts in Mexico's southern Pacific coast, bringing torrential rains and the threat of flooding as the first named storm in the eastern Pacific this year. Hitting as a Category 2 storm, Agatha barreled ashore, blowing sustained winds of 105 meters per hour west of the beach town of Port Engel in Oaxaca, before weakening as it moved inland, the U.S. National Hurricane Center said. A hotel employee at the popular Mexican surf resort said all guests have been placed in street facing rooms as a precaution. Before the storm made landfall, local officials said that they had set up 200 shelters with the capacity to shelter 26,000 people. Agatha is expected to dump 10 to 16 inches of rain on Osaka as up to 20 inches in some areas and NHS said, noting this could spark lethal flash flooding and mudslides. The NHC said that Agatha is the strongest hurricane to make landfall during the month of May along Mexico's Pacific coast since records began in 1949. The storm is expected to dissipate over southeastern Mexico by tomorrow. In the wake of the deadly shooting at Robb Elementary School and the reverence of the Memorial Day, gun legislation debates still continue. A bipartisan group of the senators have been weighing a range of proposals, including extended background checks and raising the gun buying age to 21. But some Republicans are saying that those reforms would be unfair and ineffective. On this solemn day, when sacrifice in battle binds the nation in gratitude, A different loss, often caused by weapons made for war, tears at deep divisions. What can or should government do when gun violence brings such trauma to schools and stores? Today, President Biden said the toll of gun deaths may finally bring change. I think things have gotten so bad that everybody's getting more rational about it. Mr. Biden stressed he will use his influence, but only Congress can pass real reform. But I can't outlaw a weapon. I can't, you know, change the background check. I can't do that. Under pressure to act quickly, a bipartisan group of senators is weighing a range of proposals, mindful of getting the votes. Among them, expanded background checks, red flag rules to bar weapons from those deemed a danger safe gun storage requirements, more school safety resources, raising the gun buying age to 21.
Republican Lindsey Graham today. We need a system to keep guns out of the hands of people who are mentally unstable. With due process, you just can't go take somebody's gun. However, some Republicans say those reforms would be unfair and ineffective. One, they infringe on the rights of millions and millions of gun owners. And two, they probably wouldn't have the outcome that you're hoping for. Democrats hopeful for now. And I may end up being heartbroken. Um, I am at the table in a more significant way right now with Republicans and Democrats than uh, ever before. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Somalia's new president has applauded the return of U.S. troops to help fight a deadly insurgence and says delivering security depends on reconciliation with other Somali leaders after a power battle splintered the security forces into rival factions. Somalia's new president has welcomed the return of U.S. forces to his country. U.S. President Joe Biden recently authorized the redeployment of hundreds of soldiers who will help train, equip and support Somali troops fighting the al-Qaeda-linked al-Shabaab insurgency. That's after his predecessor, Donald Trump, withdrew them in December 2020. Speaking a week after his inauguration, President Hassan Sheikh Mohamud said he was grateful to Biden. They have been building the capacity, they have been uh, mentoring the Somali National Army, they have been training and equipping them. So it's an opportunity for us to have those uh, forces in the ground right now. This is Mohamud's second stint as president. When he previously served from 2012 to 2017, rampant corruption packed the military with ghost soldiers. Those that did exist often sold their guns when wages were stolen. Since then, the United Nations has set up a long-planned biometric database. Soldiers and civil servants are paid directly to their bank accounts. Campaigners say they're watching to see if Mohamud's backers receive plum procurement contracts or top posts they can use for kickbacks. The president acknowledged complaints of corruption but said he was pressing ahead with security sector reform. Yes, ups and downs were always there, but they are in a better position now. We have at least a part of the security forces uh, uh, well reformed, integrated. Al-Shabaab has killed tens of thousands of Somalis through bombings in the capital Mogadishu and elsewhere. But a long-running rift between the former president and his prime minister distracted from the battle against militants. Mohamud said reconciliation is a priority area for his administration. We don't want to, uh, social reconciliation as such. Somalia has done a lot of social reconciliation. Now what we need is that uh, structure that follow up the social reconciliation at the local level. But the political reconciliation is the one that up to now uh, Although many times has been attempted, it has not been successful so far. His words have encouraged allies, frustrated by slow progress under Mohamud's predecessor, which allowed al-Shabaab to amass a huge war chest. Mohamud says it's not just a military war, but also financial and ideological. And it's one he says he will carry out in collaboration with international partners. After six weeks of testimonies, deliberations are underway in the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard defamation trial. As deliberations resume, legal experts say the jury has the power to find either party at fault or without blame and isn't bound to the multi-million dollar claims. Tonight, with his high-profile defamation case now in the hands of the jury, Johnny Depp is letting his hair down. The actor spotted performing on stage in England after explosive closing arguments Friday. There is a victim of domestic abuse in this courtroom, but it is not misheard. His aggressive legal team arguing heard, not Depp, was the violent spouse and lied about being abused to destroy Depp's reputation. Heard's defense firing back. If Amber was abused by Mr. Depp even one time, then she wins. Depp brought the $50 million defamation suit against Heard after she wrote a 2018 op-ed in the Washington Post where she described herself as a public figure representing domestic abuse. Though she never mentioned Depp's name, the actor says it derailed his career. I never in my life 
committed sexual battery, physical abuse. Heard is countersuing for a hundred million. He just hit me over and over and over again, and I thought this is how I die. He's going to kill me now. Deliberations begin again tomorrow. Legal experts say the jury has the power to find either party at fault or without blame and aren't bound to the multi-million dollar claims. And they could literally make a statement at the end of the trial to say, you know what, we think maybe both of you were defamed, but we're not going to award any damages. In the court of public opinion, it appears the case is already closed. But for the key audience, seven men and women in a Virginia courtroom, the jury's still out. South Korea is continuing to see a gradual decline in the number of new COVID-19 cases in the country. As a result, more virus protocols are being lifted from tomorrow. These including revisions to treatment, testing and travel restrictions. With the number of COVID-19 cases declining in South Korea, some virus protocols are set to change from June. Starting Wednesday, most community treatment centers in the country will no longer be in use. The health ministry said that it will close down 12 residential treatment centers which have been caring for those with mild COVID-19 symptoms. However, one center used to treat inbound short-term foreign visitors will remain open. Authorities will prepare additional quarantine facilities and sickbeds if the virus tally climbs back up. At the same time, the operation of the remaining 78 temporary screening clinics will also end. Those who wish to get tested should now visit public health centers. And ahead of the summer travel season, authorities are easing travel restrictions too. Also from Wednesday, those under 12 years old no longer need to quarantine if they travel with a fully vaccinated adult. Fully vaccinated refers to those who have a departure date 15 to 180 days after getting the second shot of a two-shot regimen or have had a booster. Currently, this rule only applies to children under six. In terms of testing, visitors are only required to submit PCR test results within three days of arrival. A rapid antigen test is just recommended on day six or seven. Right now, both tests are mandatory. Health officials will also work to provide more in-person treatment to those who've tested positive for COVID-19 by increasing the number of ambulatory care centers. Meanwhile, South Korea reported 17,191 new COVID-19 infections on Tuesday. That's almost three times the tally reported the day before due to more people getting tested after the weekend. There were nine related deaths and 180 critically ill patients. Korea's campaign to expand its electric vehicle charging stations has been well acknowledged by relevant authorities on the global stage. They also reportedly offer the fastest charging service, but the number of such speedy stations remain a few. South Korea's electric vehicle charging infrastructure is the best in the world. That's according to the International Energy Agency's Global Electric Vehicle Outlook 2022. According to the report, South Korea had the best ratio of cars to charging points out of the 30 countries analyzed, with one charging point for every 2.6 electric vehicles. The global average was 9.5 charging points per vehicle, while the average for Europe was 15.5. China, which boasts the world's largest EV market in the world, was found to have one charging point for every 7.2 electric vehicles. South Korea's charging points also had the highest capacity at 6.5 kilowatts per EV. The global average was at 2.4 kilowatts, while the average for Europe and China were 1 and 3.8 kilowatts, respectively. However, the report found that South Korea has many slow chargers rather than fast chargers. In fact, in 2021, of the total 105,000 chargers in South Korea, 86% were slow chargers and only 14% were fast chargers. And the number of slow chargers increased in 2020 at a faster rate than the number of fast chargers. As for the world in 2021, slow chargers made up for 68% of all chargers and fast chargers 32%. As South Korea's EV market is expected to grow, some suggest more fast chargers are needed. 
This would ensure a faster charging process for consumers and eventually lead to greater growth in the sales of electric vehicles. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's here around the world in a minute. Authorities in Nepal said that they have found the wreckage of the plane that crashed in the Himalayan country and recovered 21 bodies out of the 22 on board. The World Health Organization says it does not expect the latest identified cases of monkeypox to turn into another pandemic. But the organization's top monkeypox expert explained during a public session that there are still many unknown related to the spike in cases in non-endemic countries. In Brazil's northeastern state, the death toll from flooding and landslide following recent heavy rain has now climbed to 90 on top of that, officials say that 26 people are still missing and 4,000 people have been displaced. Shanghai authorities began dismantling fences around housing compounds and ripping police tape off public squares and buildings to the relief of the city's 25 million residents before a painful two-month lockdown to be lifted on the 1st of June. France called for an investigation after a French journalist was killed in Ukraine when the vehicle was travelling in, which was being used to evacuate civilians near the city of Severodonetsk, was hit by shelling. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with tens of thousands of people flocking to the Belgian town to witness a historic parade. Stay safe and have a good night.